Hello everyone. Welcome to TMLS Annual Machine Learning Summit. I'm Aarti Malhotra. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our panel members uh, for this panel discussion talk. Um, Dr. Ali Madani, he's a director of machine learning at Cyclica. Uh, Dr. Shazia Akbar, she's a lead machine learning engineer at Altus Labs. Santosh Hariharan, he's a principal scientist at Pfizer. Shiva Amriri, she's a VP, head of AI and data intelligence at Pivotal Life Sciences. And Javier, he's a head of data science, Phenomic AI. Welcome all the panel members, and Dr. Ali will lead the discussion. Um, we'll have a Q&A after the discussion, and please feel free to use the mic in the center of the room. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel. We are going to have a very interesting and very important conversation on bias and relevance in application of machine learning in healthcare. So what we know about this topic is machine learning is not perfect. We all know that. We build machine learning models, train and test them. And what we have to be careful is when they make mistakes, those mistakes could be biased. So we are going to start our conversation from there. So I'm going to first ask Shiva and start the conversation on this important topic. Do you need to consider these important kind of type of biases like gender bias, socioeconomic biases in your modeling? And if you do, how do you exactly tackle that issue and make sure those biases don't exist in your problems? Sure. So I can talk about two examples that I've faced at uh, two different organizations that I worked with. Um, one, I'll start with Biosymmetrics, which was a um, machine learning company in New York, and um, but most of the staff were in Toronto. So I was running that company, and we were establishing the scientific backbone and the machine learning platform. And one of the case studies we did was on imaging. So we decided we wanted to try and diagnose autism based on brain images. Uh, this was a while ago now, so keep in mind that Technology has improved and changed and algorithms have improved. Compute has gotten a lot better. But all to say that we collected images across multiple hospitals um, and some were you know, publicly available. So we collected from different machines, different uh, uh, parts of the country, different organizations. And you know, the models were pretty misleading. Um, we, we, first we got a compelling model that showed, yeah, you know, it, it, it is possible to use the model we had to diagnose autism. But when we got into it, we realized that there were a lot of steps. There was a lot of differences and biases, um, in the machinery that captured the images, for example. And so we had to really go back and work a lot on our pre-processing pipeline. Uh, to normalize the images. And unfortunately, in, in healthcare and medicine right now, it's still, there is a problem of data. Like we don't have a lot of access to data for obvious reasons. So this doesn't allow us to use the latest, you know, if you just throw millions, millions of images these days at deep learning models, you can get away with this stuff, right? You can get, you can get better with your pre-processing or um, reducing some of the biases in your models, but because of the, the privacy uh, and security issues we have in healthcare, you're limited with your data, and therefore you have to think a lot more about pre-processing, normalizing the data, and then your last step is really the machine learning piece. That's one example. The second example is more recent, and that was my time at 23andMe um, in, in um, the Bay Area. And there we have a consumer product as well as, you know, the company has two parts as a consumer health product, and then there's ancestry consumer, health consumer, and then there's a therapeutics business. I'm gonna talk about the consumer business. So we would recently develop models called polygenic risk scores. And this, these models were producing uh, predictions on your predispositions to certain disorders. So for example, do you have a higher chance of getting cholesterol? Um, what about migraines? Um, so a bunch of different like fibroids, things like that. And so we realized that these models, we had a lot of data, 23andMe is very lucky. We have over, you know, around 20 million, sorry, 12 million customers. And so we can use 
the data to create models. And the more we got into it, the more we realized to, to reduce biases, we have to focus on models that are specifically for different ethnicities. We have to even think about models for different sexes depending on the condition. Obviously some, you know, they're, they're more male conditions, female conditions and so on. So we actually worked a lot on setting up standards and, you know, sort of checkpoints and metrics for developing these types of models for different ethnicities. And the more you, you do that properly, property, the more you can sort of have confidence in your models for the different ethnicities or uh, sexes and things like that. So I think, I think, yeah, that's the direction. If you have enough data, you, you have that opportunity to get, uh, to get better and have more confidence in the models you're building. It's fantastic. Shazia, would you like to add? Yeah, I'm just gonna pop in on the imaging stuff because I work solely on imaging right now and have done for the last few years. And I think you're right in that focusing your efforts towards specific ethnicities, or in our case, we focused on, you know, hospital settings where we know the scanners are quite high resolution, they've got a certain setting to them, and, you know, we're not taking into account mobile scanners or anything like that, which might be inherently different. different. So really focusing on those as well. Um, I think it's really important that we understand that bias is in the data itself. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, doctors make their decisions, they are biased as well. You know, in lung cancer, men are more likely to get lung cancer than women. That's just the, the way those stats work. So, um, you know, we've definitely noticed that our models will use the fact that the patient is male to make the prediction as to whether or not they will develop, develop lung cancer. Um, so. We are obviously validating those and collecting that data. We're collecting data like if they're, they're a smoker or a former smoker, how many years, if they stopped smoking, did they stop smoking? Um, and you know, when we get all that information, we can use it during training to do oversampling or augmentation on those minority groups. We can, you can even build a GAN or something to simulate data in those minority groups if you can't get hold of the data itself. Um, and more recently at Altus, we've been really curious about some new networks and new deep neural networks coming out that actually target bias specifically. And one that we started looking at was published in CVPR in 2021, and it's called END, END. I think it stands for Entangle Dis uh, Disentangle. So it tries to entangle features for your target classes, but disentangle features for your bias labels. So that way you're, it's almost normalizing your data accordingly, regularizing it according to your, the bias that you know about. So these are all obviously assuming you know what your bias is, and I'm sure we'll get on to what do you do if you don't know what that bias is. Exactly, very important topic. And you touched on the importance of considering biases in technologies and how they generate data. So I wanna get into this topic that bias is not necessarily in the topic of responsible AI. So we have biases that could reduce performance of the models, like in imaging technologies, in chemical measurements or biological measurements. So I was wondering, Santosh, so how exactly do you approach those concerns when you use the data in your models? So um, the, whole, the whole idea of you know, having the bias, and even, even in early, so I work in early drug discovery uh, with, with microscope images a lot. Uh, we're recently part of a consortium, a multi-pharma consortium, where we are generating the images for the exact same set of perturbation, right, across pharma companies. So this is, uh, we know that this is a bias because across the pharma companies, you have different instruments, even though it's the same biological data. It's a different instrument that generates it. Um, it's a different way. Some person holds a pipette slightly differently. We may have a bias there, we don't know. Um, but eventually all these data comes together and we try to, uh, you know, so, sort of put it, put a huge overlay and visualize the data. And we could easily say, this comes from this guy. You know, it's all separated out very well. Um, so we had this experimental bias coming together and we were trying to, uh, uh, you know, sort of derive uh, deep learning models uh, where you, you would have trained, you know, across the data sets, across having all the, all the multi uh, centers together as part of the training, and then leave out one center for testing, and it still didn't work. Um, so uh, these are very strong biases that we had to take it, and we were uh, looking now for you know, more statistical methods that could help reduce it. And there are some that, that we could use. 
um, as well. Uh, but there's more uh, deep learning approaches like efficient nets and those which uh, when you carefully design them as to what data you input, uh, they were able to uh, reduce the bias largely if not eliminate them completely. Um, this is very important for us in, in the early drug discovery process uh, because we want to ensure that the predictions that give are reproducible across the pharma domain. And this is one of the reasons why we were, we were essentially the whole exercise started off with standardizing the experiments. And uh, even after we did the process, everything was followed the same way. We still found these biases. And, and it, to be honest, it's still an ongoing process. It was the best way to correct for them. Um, so. Great. Thanks, Antosh. Javier, do you want to add to that on imaging? I think you're also working on imaging data. Uh, I don't. I don't work. Uh, at, we don't work at Phenomic right now with imaging, although it's part of the company early early days. But the type of data that we work with now is more from a structural genomics data, um, but it also has its own types of biases, and many of them are related to, I would say, sociological aspects of the way the data is collected in hospitals or in the academia. Um, some numbers put like from all the genome-wide association studies, which are probably one of the most commonly run studies across all the entire world. Up to 70% of the, of the data comes from European uh, individuals. The rest of the world is represented in the 30% remaining, which is very hard for machine learning because if you want to uh, develop a product that can be used for different uh, ethnicities, if your, if your data is biased 70% to one type of uh, genetic background, then you will have a, a big issue. And the same holds with the type of data that is being collected more recently. Um, the way we try to overcome this situation is stratifying samples, being aware that you have that type of issue, and when you are running your model, try to reduce the overrepresentation of sample types, in this case, from Europeans. Uh, but one point that I want to mention also is, um, that is very important is, often the data providers don't tell you the ethnicity even, or the gender, they just release the data. So I think there is a big need for standardization of best practices in terms of publishing data. And I think the community has to put a lot of more effort pushing the journals to ask authors to provide a minimum set of characteristics. Of course, you have to be aware of data privacy and all those concerns, but a minimum set of characteristics from the donors that have to be included in the, in the data set so that we can later on filter out uh, redundant data sets or make a more balanced type of training data set. Yeah, that's very important. And one important thing you partially, both of you touched on is, when we go through the process of the biasing, sometimes we also lose signal because some part of it is part of the information in your models. Great. So I want to go back to a, very, to a very important point that Shiva mentioned, that we have a life cycle when we do modeling. It's not like writing a couple of lines of code, do model training and testing, and that's it. So we go through data collection, selection, wrangling, training, testing, deployment, and get into all these kind of stage to bring a product to a production stage and monitor it. So I was wondering how you think these components, modularization of the machine learning model, help in identifying biases and provide opportunities to remove them? Yeah, um, I can certainly uh, say a bit about that. Uh, you know, I, I, I think these controlled processes certainly have their advantages. And one of the things I've learned in uh, you know, I, either working in software engineering teams or being peripheral to them is just the software engineering life cycle, the software development life cycle itself. And I think this is one of the, uh, the reasons why the technology sector has done really well is because they are in this controlled cycle, but it all, they also have the opportunity to open source their code. So open AI, stability AI, there's been a lot of movement in machine learning, in AI, to open source, let the community contribute, but also there is a cycle of things that happens within the organization before a, a, a product is you know, put into production, for example, before a code is checked in. So I think there's control mechanisms there. I think there's an opportunity for people to bring in their ideas. I think the fact that there's a lot of testing, the data is 
checked and verified and pre-processed, and then there's multiple levels before you get finally to that modeling piece. I think all of the, these things are, are advantages. Um, I can give a, an example of uh, another company I worked at called Zymergen. And here, it was a robotics automation um, company where we were perturbing microbes uh, to create new chemicals, drugs, agricultural paint, whatever. And this was, you know, this was a nice tight cycle of automation. It's called the DBTAL cycle, design, build, analyze, test. Um, and so what you do is you start out, you collect a lot of data through robotics and experimentation in the lab, but that has to be tightly controlled because then you're gonna inject, going back to the bias conversation, you're gonna inject a lot of bias right at the start there. But the advantage is there is that you are creating your own data. You're not like taking from public sources or you know, trying to combine multiple data sets, which has its own challenges. But that's a controlled way of collecting the data. And then you have to wrap a lot of sort of statistical methods around that to normalize it. And then that comes into the software engineering process of pre-processing that data, um, wrapping analytics, and then finally getting it to, to the machine learning stage. And I think you, in some types of companies where there's large data sets, where there, you know, you're trying to come up with like a drug or a diagnostic or something, the th things need to be controlled in order to get the most out of the data. So I think they, they have worked well, uh, and they, but there's room to improve them, obviously. And I think this is a way to reduce bias and also to make sure that you're not injecting different things into the process and into the data as you're trying to build a product or a diagnostic. That's a very important point for sure. So, and all these modules definitely help us to pinpoint where could be the source of issue when we consider these kind of components. Yeah. Not necessarily have everything all together in an amalgamated way that <laughs> something happens yeah. in academia or industry. So um, anybody wants to add to that? I, I, I want to, to mention that I've seen uh, a good number, including some of the vendors <laughs> outside of the room who are working on solutions to particularly address this type of situation where you don't know where your model is failing or where your model is losing predictability power. So they, they are, I think they are doing a very good job at telling us the NA values are appearing here uh, in this part of the pipeline or uh, this version is where you started to lose power. I think that's something really different from what used to happen say in the general genomics field 10 years ago where it would be one PhD student that built everything from A to Z, publish a paper, that's it. Now it's more scalable, more uh, transparent in that way, and there is more legacy in terms of the next person who will take over the project will continue with this pipeline that is working and can track where things are failing. I think that's very, very important. Yeah. Just want to add one more thing. Um, I agree to all that. The, uh, another aspect you want to add is you have to know something about the domain that you're working with. Um, if you don't have it, that, that it leads to a completely different bias that you do not know of. So I was just telling somebody an, an incident um, that happened, I won't say which company, um, uh, but um, really it was a simple data set, just looking at images of disease and non-disease, right? And uh, they have an automated workflow. Uh, as soon as the images are acquired, it goes through and there's a whole deep learning pipeline extract and categorizes, you know, compounds that work and don't work. Um, and the data scientists came back and like, wow, look at this, we have, we have a great model, it works great, everything's fantastic. And the biologist says, something is out here, we're getting a 30% hit rate, that never happens. Yeah, I know. Uh, and when they look at it, eventually when they looked at the images, um, and this guy went, up, went back and looked at the images, which is crap and more crap. So this is what, so the entire experiment was at fault. Nobody looked at the images. Nobody knew the domain knowledge that was happening. And that's, that's very important to know that where your bias can come from. Um, without his expertise, you know, you would have never caught it and you would have spent, you know, months characterizing these compounds. Right, yeah, that was definitely a very important point. So the domain knowledge definitely helped us to figure out if there is an issue in our data early on before we get into production. So we talked about deep learning models. So everybody got excited, maybe in most of you in this room, about machine learning by knowing about some of the success stories and deep learning back maybe in 2012. Maybe some of you were familiar with this topic before that even. But 
as we move toward deep learning era, we also increase this opportunity that our models become less and less interpretable. So, Shazi, I was wondering what you think about the risks that these kind of low interpretability models could bring in terms of injecting bias into our systems or in terms of being able to identify biases and remove them. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to understand that, yes, they are less interpretable than, say, decision trees or something that we might have used a few years ago. So I think that's important to know. But I also think we all do know that because we all always talk about like the black box and opening up this black box. I think we're very aware of that when we are building the models. And I think that actually helps us when we are trying to identify bias because we're already quite, um, you know, quite invested in uh, discovering it already. It's not like we're going to let it bypass us without additional um, validation and training, which is obviously what you would first thing to do is to test and validate your model on all of these subtypes. Um, for those of you who have listened to me before, you already know that I actually am a big fan of XAI, Explainable AI. Um, I think it's a fascinating field. It's a great way to open up our models and actually know what's going on inside for debugging, for validation, for deployment as well. I think it can help in all stages. Um, and, you know, there's several um, XCI methods out there, you know, post after you finish training and you're looking at your model, you can use, um, I think a lot of people in healthcare use CAM or GradCAM to really look at uh, heat maps and visualize specific images and what it's paying attention to. Um, but, you know, there are other techniques out there. There's text generation models, which will actually generate some text to tell you what's happening in the image. And you can actually compare that to what the doctor's notes are or something like that. And with, if you're working with generative models, you can use your latent space to generate some new images and see what your latent space is learning. I think there's tons of techniques out there to really tease and see what's going on inside of your, um, inside of your models. So, um, Yes, they are not as interpretable, but I think we're getting ahead of, you know, how can we make them more interpretable as Fantastic, well? Fantastic, for sure. Yeah. So any other common centers? <laughs> you seem interested in the topic. Oh, yeah. Um, we were just having this conversation today morning, actually, with my company folks, um, where, you know, uh, we have, we're comparing a traditional method of, of non-deep learning method of, of um, analyzing these images versus a deep learning method and the deep learning outperforms. And the only question um, uh, my supervisor asked is why? And that stopped the email. Nobody knew why. Um, I think that's very important. So my, my, my supervisor is a biologist and you know we need to know why certain things happen, especially um, when you're doing, it's, it's better to know it early than later. Um, some of these uh, CI models might might really help us, you know, deriving that that insight and and to really know why. And um, even when you when you present this to other stakeholders who are not data scientists, uh, especially for them, they would really want to know what's going on behind the scenes. Great, awesome. So we have one last question, which is about the relevance of the data we generate to eventually help patients and people in healthcare setting, which is very important because we always have pipelines for drug discovery or for bringing a product to help in insurance setting or clinical setting. And I was wondering if any one of you have any insights regarding how you approach this problem to know the problem you're solving and the data that gets into our, your model to solve that problem eventually help patients and people in healthcare setting? I can, I can talk to that because I'm working on this project right now and it comes back to Santosh's point in that really know your problem. I mean, really, really know your problem at this stage. If you're gonna, we're working on a pneumonia project where we're looking to um, predict the risk of an emergency, uh, emergency department patient and if they need to be admitted into hospital. Um, so in that case, the first question we asked, well, how long does it take for someone who's in the emergency department to get to the hospital uh, right now? And what are the steps you're taking and why does it take so long? And then we said, okay, if we put our system in there and we had a really high specificity, so we only admitted people who really need to be admitted into the hospital. So really you're thinking about your threshold there. 
how many patients can we get through to in, inpatient into the hospital, uh, how much faster, how much would it save you, would it actually help anyone in AD once you've done that, do you even have the resources in the hospital to support all these people coming in much faster than they would do before? I mean, these are all the questions you need to ask your collaborators and really talk about, is this even feasible in the setting you have right now? And if it's not, or if some adjustments need to be made, that's when you go back to the model and you're like, okay, I can make this adjustment. This is how it would look now. Go back to your collaborators and say, is this more feasible than the previous approach we proposed? I mean, the opposite of that is that same model can be used for early discharge of patients who can just go home without needing to see, you know, five different people before they're told you can go home. And, you know, then your sensitivity is super, super high, but you know, what are the impacts of doing that? What if you have people coming back? What do you do then? Um, and I think you can't answer those as a machine learning engineer. You really, really need to talk to your collaborators, operators, the hospitals, and really get their input on that. Great, thanks a lot, Shazia. Great, so for the sake of time, we wanna open up the question round. So if anybody has any question from the panelists, I think one the there. lady in the front and then the gentleman in the back. Hello, board. Thank you so much for all explanations. Actually, uh, I have a question regarding uh, medical data sets, some of them open sources and some of them, most of them not. But what, uh, actually I have some experience working on image data for retina images, OCT images. And uh, what I mainly found about them, it's like the, num the uh, I mean the number of instances in the data sets are not, they are very few in comparison to the population we have on Earth. And so for training, are, are these, I mean, uh, can we say that the, the results are for training are really trustable for, I mean, for the process? This is uh, my first question. And my second question is regarding, um, like, uh, for example, I have experience for, uh, like, um, uh, uh, for bioinformatics in a Kegel competition. I don't have any information about biology, but it was about transcription and translation of genes. So if I don't have a dominant specific knowledge, so how can I, so how can I be more productive and have better performance? This is my second question. Um, and I tried to learn, but I think I'm not like a biologist. Uh, okay, so th thank you so much. So I I'm going to repeat the first question. If I understood correctly, you're saying for a specific domain that you might not have enough number of data points, for example, images in the case. Yeah, my first question is uh, regarding the number of instances in the data sets. Most of the data sets are very few. I don't. I, and, uh, I don't know how they can generalize it for 7 billion people on Earth. This is yeah. my first question. Thank okay. you. Okay, so re regarding generalizability from small data sets, models that need to be built on small data sets. Yes. Please. In my opinion, it's very common that in general, people will try to go with the hype of doing machine learning deep learning, and you will hear companies or organizations in general who want to have a big data department, even though they don't have the data to do the analysis. Um, I will really go back to basic statistics in those cases, do exploratory data analysis, go to the basics, because if you don't have enough data points, you can still input um, the, in the, the inputs to PyTorch or whatever libraries you want to use, you will have outputs, F1 metrics and everything, but it doesn't tell you anything really because the data points are so few. So I would say in those particular cases, do first statistics, traditional statistics, and see how things look. I know it's always tempting to go big and... 100%, <laughs> I agree with that, yes. yes. Maybe deep neural networks isn't what you should be using on that stage. Um, I also don't think it's, it's reasonable to expect a tiny data set of 100 to generalize to the entire population. I think that's a 
reasonable yeah. as well. So you need to be a little bit realistic about how you can translate whatever you're doing to the outside world as well. Yeah, and also whenever you build a model, just remember it's not only about the prediction, you have uncertainty in each one of your predictions. So, and it is hard to say if you have enough data points to build a classical machine learning model or more advanced ones, but at the end of the day, you can assign confidence and uncertainty to each one of those models. So I didn't get your second question, honestly. Anybody here? I, I can take a stab at it. I think you were asking about um, whether someone who doesn't have training in biology, for example, could work in biology, healthcare, machine learning. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I've worked in almost all situations where there were folks who were experts in one space, and then they were working alongside people who had the biological knowledge. Um, so I think it's uh, sort of unreasonable for companies to demand that everyone they hire as an, is an expert in all areas that they're working in. I think it's really the onus is on the person to try as much as possible to have interest in that area and trying to pick up as much as possible on the biology side or the software engineering side if, if it's the other way around. Uh, I've seen it be very successful. Um, you know, I think as long as the interest is there and they sort of, uh, or they may not even need to know depending on what it is they're working on. They may need to not know a, a lot about biology if they're building a specific module, for example depending on the size of the company, so. Great, thanks. I think there was one more question at the end. Yeah, here. Um, thank you, everyone, for a great, great topic. So when I, when I um, think about BIOS, so I, I, while, while BIOS has at least 15 different type of BIOSes, there are very similar terms like error or natural differences or measurement, different unit of measurements. So what is your take on, because each of these have different treatments. So BIOS has its own treatment, error has its own treatment, different unit of measurement has its own treatment. How do we make sure we, we or, or people who are using the data for machine learning are not mistreating the, right. the actual cause? It, it's like misdiagnosing cancer versus something else and mistreating it. How would you see that happens in healthcare and what can we do about it? Well, I can give you uh, that. That certainly happens, to be honest. Um, and it's not because they misdiagnose it, it's because they write something for other purposes. So I worked with this um, healthcare data, so patient records, uh, getting all the patient records. And one of the things we were going at was ICD codes. And um, we worked a lot. We uh, create a lot of modeling based on ICD codes, and we're trying to predict you know, patient outcomes based on that. Eventually going back, realizing that the doctors were putting ICD codes for billing purposes. So the diagnosis that they put there may not be the true diagnosis that they really um, intended to put. Or sometimes you don't have an ICD code for what they were trying to do. There's just two possibilities that to do. So, there is a bias that, that gets generated because of that, but um, you, uh, it, it, may not be a, um, uh, it may not be a subtle bias, as we might want to see that the model is generating. There's a bias in the data itself. Um, and you need to know, so we, luckily we had a collaborator um, who was a doctor in, in, the, in this case, and, and we were working with him um, to understand what was going on. So what we landed up doing was removing those patient records completely so that it doesn't influence our model at all. We still had enough samples, so we didn't have to worry about it. But that's not the case every time. Thanks, Santosh. Unfortunately, because of the time, we have to end here. Thanks to all the panelists for providing their insights for us, and thank you all for listening.